Good afternoon everyone and welcome back to the Australian Reptile Park. My name is Jake, I'm one of the senior reptile keepers here at the park and uh, we've been doing these live videos for quite a few weeks now. We hope you are enjoying them and uh, most of all we're trying to bring you as many of our residents as we possibly can and most importantly uh, teach you a little bit about them. Now today we're going to be looking at a specific snake species, one of my favourites, and uh, snakes are really what I am most passionate about. I've been obsessed and involved with snakes for uh, a very, very long time and I've been very fortunate growing up in Australia because as many people are familiar with, um, we have some just incredible snake species and of course many of those are ranked amongst the world's most toxic snakes. Now today, uh, we're not looking at number four or number two in the world in terms of strength of venom. We are actually looking at number one, uh, the world's most toxic snake or the world's most venomous snake. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to uh, grab the snake out of the bin here and we'll see how we go. Now this is what I refer to as an inland taipan, although you may also see this snake referred to as the western taipan, small scaled snake or fierce snake. They do have a number of uh, common names. Their scientific name, which does not change, is Oxyonus microlepidotus. And they do share that genus with uh, two other species. Uh, the first is the western desert taipan, which is found primarily in the Great Victoria Desert of Western Australia, close to the uh, Northern Territory and South Australian borders, very remote part of the country. And in fact, they were our last large venomous snake to be uh, taxonomically described. They were only discovered and described in 2006. And uh, that just speaks to the, the uh, remoteness of the region that they come from. It's typical Central Australian uh, red sand spinifex type habitat, and they're a beautiful snake. Our other species, which is known as the coastal taipan, is found from uh, southeast Queensland. They extend up, of course, through Townsville, Cairns, up into the Cape. And then they are also found in parts of the top end and down into the Kimberley region in WA. So they are very much a northern uh, tropical species of taipan. Now there is also a taipan in Papua New Guinea and for a long time they were regarded as a subspecies of the coastal taipan. But in actual fact, uh, northern Australia and Papua New Guinea have only been separate land masses for about 6,000 years. And as a result, genetically those two snakes are the same snake. Um, they are pretty well identical. The only difference between the two is a bit of a colour difference. Your PNG taipan tends to be quite a bit darker and they often have quite a nice orange uh, vertebral stripe which will run uh, down the back. They are a very attractive looking snake. Um, so that's the other species of taipan but today we are here to talk about this one here. This is, as I mentioned, the inland taipan. You find this species out, again, in a very remote part of the country. This species is found uh, primarily in southwest Queensland, um, close to towns known as Windora, Birdsville, Bedowry, and then they're also found down through Goiter's Lagoon in South Australia and down to Cuba Pedy. So um, some very harsh, arid environments. And uh, so, arid and, and harsh in fact that this species, um, we really didn't know too much about it until the 1970s. Technically it was described in 1879, um, but we really didn't start to see live specimens uh, turn up until the 1970s. And what we realized is that this snake has a fascinating ecology or um, basically day-to-day -day life. They live, as I mentioned, very remote in a habitat type known as uh, black soil. Out there we call it the channel country and that black soil habitat is basically a soil that cracks when it's exposed to high, to high temperatures. Now what you end up with is a very harsh barren environment on the surface. There's very little in the way of vegetation um, and trees. It's pretty well a lifeless landscape or it looks like it is. Um, but in actual fact below the surface you have a labyrinth of tunnels and burrows and cracks in which most of the wildlife in that region live down in. Um, areas where this snake occurs can get over 50 degrees Celsius in the height of summer. Any snake caught out in that, those sort of temperatures um, is a dead snake. They have to stay a little bit cooler than that. And so what the inland taipan has evolved to do is spend most of its life down in those deep soil cracks uh, out in that channel country. 
Now, of course, down in those cracks, um, it's nice and dark, and there's also a plethora of food for the snake um, during certain years. The environment, it's a boom and bust environment, so it goes through um, very dramatic changes in terms of food availability, depending on uh, rainfall. When there's a lot of rain and uh, times are good, insects are abundant, the mammals are abundant, and the snakes are fat and healthy, they're feeding well, they're happy. Um, but of course, this snake here, it can go through periods of um, drought, very dry periods when food is uh, virtually non-existent. And uh, so they have to be very, very tough and very resilient in order to make their way through those uh, harder times. Now, of course, the one thing that tip people typically associate with this species is the fact that they are the world's most toxic snake or the world's most venomous snake. And that is the case. Um, and the way that we measure toxicity of snake species is through a test known as the LD50 test. Now that LD stands for lethal dose and it is essentially a test done on rodents um, to determine the toxicity of a snake. And what you end up with is a bunch of figures which you can then rank or list and uh, that will tell you who's more toxic than who. Now going off that, uh, measurement, that LD50. This taipan here, the inland taipan, is the world's most toxic snake. They have a figure of 0 0.025 uh, milligrams. It's a bit scientific and hard to kind of uh, imagine, but basically what that equates to is this snake with one drop of venom, just one, uh, can kill roughly 100 adult humans or about 250,000 mice. They are an incredibly toxic snake. Now in saying that, this snake has never attributed to a human death. There is not a single human death uh, to this snake's name. And that goes back to them living in, in an incredibly remote part of the country. Um, the only people that have been bitten by these snakes, and there has been bites that have occurred, are people working with them in captivity, um, people that are keeping them. You can keep this snake legally in this country with the appropriate licensing. And in other parts of the world as well, they are also kept in the United States and Europe. And there have been a few bites that have occurred in the wild as well. But again, those people that have been bitten in the wild have been people out in their habitat uh, looking for the species, specifically snake people. So uh, this is not a snake that causes bites um, in the general public. It's simply not a snake that people uh, would typically encounter. Now they are a beautiful snake and the interesting thing about them is they can look incredibly different depending on whether you are looking at the same snake in summer or winter. They go through a very dramatic seasonal colour shift. Right now we are coming into the cooler months of the year. Um, we're almost in June now and as a result this snake is quite a bit darker than it was in January or February. If we were to come back in seven or eight months time, uh, what you would notice is this snake would be uh, quite a nice bright yellow colour. Typically most of them do have that nice dark head on them, um, but during summer they are pretty well a solid yellow snake, not unlike the beautiful uh, ventral or belly surface that we can see there. That doesn't tend to tend to change too much, but um, the surface of the snake certainly does. It's quite a bit darker than it would be in the middle of summer. And that's simply an adaptation to deal with the temperatures that they're exposed to. In winter, they're darker to absorb more heat. Um, darker colors allow snakes to thermoregulate far more efficiently. When you're a little bit lighter, you can actually reflect a bit of heat and keep yourself a little bit cooler. So it's a nice adaptation to living in a very harsh, hot part of the country. Now, the way that this snake will basically thermoregulate, it's gonna come out in the morning. It will leave its uh, soil crack, it'll head out, it'll bask close by, perhaps even going out into an open surface like a road, and then it'll bask for a short period. This snake only needs to bask for maybe 20 minutes or half an hour to reach its optimum body temperature. It's typically doing this in the very early morning, so 7, 7.30 in the morning before the heat of the day arrives, and then they might come back out um, in the late afternoon when the day cools off a bit and occasionally during the warmest times of the year um, They may become nocturnally active or active at night So all they're really trying to do is beat the heat stay out of it and uh, Thermoregulate as best they can and as I mentioned during winter when it's very very cool It gets very cold where these snakes come from um, They are that darker color to absorb heat more readily now, I think we are gonna get some questions. This snake's being pretty well behaved. Um, this is a long-term captive snake. It's been here at the park since 2012. It's about 10 years of age, and uh, this one here is about six feet in length, almost exactly six foot. 
um, which is 1.8 meters, not quite as large as they get, certainly a large uh, male snake, but in saying that, I have seen specimens that um, have exceeded two meters in length, and uh, one of the largest on record was about 2.25 or 2.3 meters in length, which is over seven foot. Um, fairly typical of the taipans, they get fairly large. Um, your coastal taipan can exceed eight feet in length. So they are a reasonably large group of Australian elapids or front fanged venomous snakes. And it just so happens that they all um, rank very, very highly in terms of venom toxicity. Now, because he is being so quiet right now, what we might do is we'll keep him out for a couple of questions here. And uh, yeah, we'll answer a few questions. So one of their common names is the fierce snake, yep. but this guy seems to be quite placid. Now, is that because he's a, a captive snake or is it just generally their nature? So it's a bit of a tricky one. In captivity, a lot of specimens are reasonably quiet, this one included. Um, in saying that, they are an incredibly unpredictable snake. This is a species that you can fall into a false sense of security with really, really easily. When this snake wants to, it can be incredibly dangerous. I've seen this snake on bad days. It's actually the snake that we display in our reptile house. I handle this snake almost every single day to uh, service his enclosure. Occasionally he has bad days and in that circumstance, they can be an incredibly dangerous snake. People typically associate coastal taipans with being uh, the far more dangerous of the two to work with. But in my experience and in my opinion, uh, an inland taipan on a bad day can be just as quick, just as dangerous as any coastal taipan. And I've actually seen this species in the wild and uh, that wild one that uh, myself and a couple of mates found back in 2017 was far from a quiet snake, an incredibly dangerous snake to work with. And uh, they can really do some very, very scary things when they want to. So that name fierce snake, um, it typically does not refer to the temperament of the snake. Um, like any snake, when left alone, they're very relaxed, shy, secretive. All they want to do is be left alone, as I mentioned. Um, that name fear snake more so refers to one, their venom, and two, the environment they are occurring. One of the traits that coastal taipans are really well known for is their large fangs. Yep. Do fear snakes have the same? I mean, looking at this guy now, his head looks significantly smaller than a coastal tie's. Yeah, so in terms of their venom yield or their venom output, and also their fang length, um, both of those two things are smaller on an inland taipan than a coastal taipan. Um, coastal taipans tend to have a fairly large, um, broad head, very large venom yields, as you may have seen in some of our venom extraction videos. We've milked coastal taipans on video before. Um, the inland taipan average venom yield is about 40 to 50 milligrams, and their fangs are reasonably small. In saying that, um, in terms of a dry bite, um, which is basically where the snake will bite, inject venom, uh, sorry, not inject venom, and then release. Um, that is a very rare occurrence with taipans, regardless of the species. So um, very small fangs, but still very, very good at doing what they do. So we milk taipans here at the park. Do you milk uh, inland taipans or just the coastal taipans? No, so we only milk the, the coastal variety, um, which is Oxyronus scutellatus. And the reason for that, as I mentioned, they get larger, um, they produce more venom, which basically means we have to interact with fewer snakes in order to produce the same amount of venom. There's no point us um, milking a bunch of inland taipans like this here to produce the coastal, uh, sorry, produce the taipan anti-venom because uh, the anti-venom produced with the coastal taipans venom works very efficiently on this species as well and all the taipans. So you only have to milk that one large, um, species that gives a large amount of venom and that covers all the taipan species. So we don't milk the inland taipan here. So you've mentioned it's the most venomous snake uh, is in toxicity. So do you then consider it the most dangerous snake or do you consider maybe a snake that's found more around humans and is it an Australian snake? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I hear a lot of people refer to this snake as the world's deadliest snake or the world's most dangerous snake. Um, that is certainly not the case. As I mentioned, whilst they do have incredibly toxic venom, this snake has never caused a human fatality and uh, really interacts with humans on a very infrequent basis. The only people, as I mentioned, that encounter these snakes are typically people that are out specifically looking for them, like me. Um, when it comes to a dangerous or a, a deadly snake, 
Um, those sorts of species you're talking about would be Russell's vipers from Asia, saw scaled uh, vipers, spectacled cobras. These snakes cause thousands of human deaths uh, every single year. In terms of an Australian snake that I would deem a dangerous snake, um, it would probably be the Eastern Brown Snake, which is not far behind. It's number two in the world for strength of venom, but it also occurs in the most highly populated region of the country and is our leading cause of snake bite death. So in terms of a, a more dangerous snake in Australia, um, the Eastern Brown Snake certainly um, would be considered that as opposed to this inland Taipan. World's most toxic snake, but certainly not uh, the world's deadliest or most dangerous snake. A really interesting question just came through and um, it'd be great if you could answer it. Why does it need such toxic venom if it has very few enemies out in the wild or does it have enemies that aren't humans? It's a really good question and one I'll, uh, I'll probably talk for a bit on. Um, it's primarily got to do with um, prey, what they're feeding on, their prey, and also prey availability. Taipans, all the species, are mammal specialists. So they're feeding on things, um, well, this species in particular would be feeding on long-haired rat. So they're feeding on large rodents, potentially um, small marsupial, uh, carnivorous marsupials, so your dozy urids. Um, and in the case of the coastal taipan, um, they may even feed on bandicoot. Now these are reasonably large mammals that have huge teeth, um, good claws on them. They can cause a lot of damage to the snake. So what that snake wants to do is subdue that prey item very, very quickly in order to save itself almost. It doesn't want to get bitten or scratched by the rodent it's killing in the process. Um, so it has that incredibly toxic venom um, to knock it over really, really quickly. Now in the case of this species, we're also talking about prey availability. Remember I spoke about that boom and bust period. Out where this snake occurs, um, you can have really, really good years with high amounts of rainfall, and then you can have um, periods of several years that are incredibly dry and f uh, food is very few and far between. So um, if this snake comes across a long-haired rat down in one of those soil cracks, it has to get it. If it doesn't, it might not live another six months. That, that might have been its only food item that it's seen that year. So it has to grab it. It doesn't really have a choice. And uh, it has to have that incredibly toxic venom again to make sure that it kills that prey item, make sure it doesn't get hurt in the process, and make sure that it doesn't go too far. You can imagine if this snake's bitten a rat and it takes three or four minutes for that rat to die, that rat could have run 50 or 100 meters through that labyrinth of uh, tunnels under the ground and that snake may not find it again. It needs to make sure that that um, rodent can be found, it can be consumed, and uh, as a result, the venom works incredibly quickly and uh, it's very, very efficient. Is this a full-grown specimen? It is, yeah. This is a male. Um, this snake is roughly six foot, pretty well bang on six foot. Um, they do get a little larger than this, but this would be considered uh, a large adult snake. Um, to give you a bit of a comparison, the male snake that I saw um, in Cuba Pedi back in 2017. Uh, he was only about 1.2, 1.3 meters, which is more of an average size. Um, this is, just happens to be a, a fairly large individual, but they do get a little bit larger than this. And obviously ty uh, coastal taipans get a lot bigger. Correct, yeah. So uh, coastal taipan, um, they look very different as well, as I mentioned, the difference in the head shape. Um, and they also, also tend to be more of a uniform tan or brown color. Um, occasionally they can be a little bit darker and they do go through that seasonal color change as well, but not to the extent that this species does. Um, but yeah, the coastal taipan can get up to about uh, eight or nine feet in length, potentially. They are one of our largest Australian venomous snakes. We had someone asking, what is it in your hand that you're using? I mean, I know it's a snake hook, but do you want to go through why you use a snake hook for venomous species? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, to most people, I mean, I see one of these every single day. I use one every single day, but um, to most people, this looks like quite a, a foreign object. It is a snake hook, and uh, essentially what it is, a very simple design. It's just a golf club with the end taken off, and we uh, place a little bit of bent uh, metal at the end. Um, people use stainless steel. This one happens to be aluminium, so it's a very lightweight hook. Um, there's all different types of hooks that you can use. And essentially what we're doing is using this hook um, as, an extension, as an extension of our body or our arm. So um, if this snake was in the enclosure, I would use this hook to hook part of the body, bring the tail toward me, and then I can uh, hold the tail. This technique that we use for most of our Australian uh, venomous snakes, where we hold the tail and then we hook about a third of the way down the body, 
is known as uh, tailing. We're holding the tail, but then we're supporting the body of the snake um, with the hook and we're using it as a bit of a barrier between uh, our body and the snake as well. We might pop him away now. Yeah. And while you're popping him away, I know it's hard to multitask, but um, do you want to go through the top 10 most venomous snakes in the world? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, this list changes all the time, but um, for the most part, uh, the I guess the widely accepted list that we tend to go off is Eastern Brown Snakes being number two in the world. Um, and as I mentioned, they are our leading cause of snake bite death. Uh, number three in the world is the Coastal Taipan, so a very close relative of this snake. Uh, then you have the Tiger Snake, which um, going back a hundred years used to be our, uh, our leading cause of snake bite death since being taken over by the brown snake and then after that um, it almost becomes a mix of other brown snake species there's death adders um, so that top 10 list it can be a little bit hard to uh, say exactly what it is and um, there's a few overseas species that come in as well the spectacle cobra for example that I mentioned before which causes thousands of deaths a year um, is about 50 times less toxic than that inland taipan, but um, still ranked amongst the world's most venomous snakes. It just so happens that most of them uh, do occur here in Australia. Lucky us. <laughs> Lucky us indeed. I was only going to ask one more question, but another really interesting one that I think we haven't spoken about yet on any of our live streams. Do you have any suggestions for people overcoming snake phobias? Uh, I would honestly, the best thing you can do is learn a bit about them. Um, I think a lot of the, the phobias and fears surrounding snakes has got to do with a lack of knowledge. People see them as these very foreign animals. Um, of course, they've got no legs. They're very different to most other animals, which we might be able to relate with a little more. Um, snakes are very foreign. They're typically very feared. And I think once people start to learn a little bit about them um, and perhaps uh, initially interact with one, uh, try and hold your first non-venomous snake if you can um, to try and overcome that fear and yeah, learn a bit about them because a lot of that fear that we have seen for um, millennia has been attributed to people just not knowing enough about snakes. And do you know what the chances actually are in Australia of being bitten slash even being bitten to being killed by a snake? Yeah, absolutely. So in Australia each year we see um, between 1,000 and 3,000 snake bites typically. Um, a fair portion of those are going to be non-venom species and a lot of them are going to be venomous species technically but small venomous species that it really pose no threat to humans um, the chances of you being bitten by a large dangerously venomous snake are very very slim and each year um, we only really see between maybe 50 and 250 or 300 uh, cases of anti-venom being administered so um, it's a very very uh, low chance of you being bitten to start with and then even fewer from you dying of a snake bite. On average, we see one to two deaths per year. Um, some years, no deaths whatsoever. Very, very different in this country in comparison to others overseas. Um, for example, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, you can see up to 50,000, 60,000 snake bite deaths um, per year. So it really is a very significant medical issue in those parts of the world. Um, here, not at all really. And I guess that leads on to my last question. Um, snake bite first aid. Yep. So we've got a, a pretty good technique here in Australia, which do. does help with lowering those numbers. Do you mind going through that with everyone? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll, I'll firstly just uh, mention that this is not a technique that is exclusively uh, used in Australia. It was developed in Australia by uh, Professor Strawn Sutherland, and it works very, very well for all of our Australian uh, venomous snakes, but you can also use this um, for some overseas species, um, particularly ones that are closely related to our snakes. So cobras, mambas, um, anything that has um, basically a very fast acting neurotoxic venom, you may want to use a pressure bandage for. Now, the basic procedure is fairly simple and uh, it's a very simple, uh, I guess, method as well. You're using the bandage to slow the movement of venom. So say I was bitten on the hand here, what I would do is wrap this bandage over the bite site about two or three times, about the same tension that you would for a sprained ankle or wrist. We then start to head up the limb. Now you wanna keep that bandage reasonably taut. I've got a, uh, a shirt on here today, a long sleeve shirt. I'm just gonna go straight over the top of that. There's no point mucking around and delaying uh, things, wasting time by trying to take your shirt off. What I would take off though is a watch if you've got one on, rings, bracelets, bangles. Take those things off because they are going to obscure you down the track. You don't wanna lose a finger just because you're uh, 
the rings cut your circulation off. So you want to bandage reasonably tight. I'm going to stop there, but you do go right to the top of the shoulder if you're bitten on the uh, hand or the arm. If you're bitten on the toe, don't bandage your arm. Uh, you want to bandage entire, uh, the entirety of your leg up to the groin. So it's very important that you do this as quickly as you possibly can because what you are doing is slowing the movement of venom throughout your system. Tie pans in particular, they have uh, what we call a neurotoxic venom. It affects your central nervous system. Um, so it basically hinders messages being transferred between the brain and your muscles, causing paralysis. Now, if you're whacking a bandage on, you are slowing the movement of that venom and you are slowing the onset of those symptoms. You could have a bandage on for six, seven hours and you may not see anything until you get to hospital and they start to remove that bandage. So it is very effective, it works very well and uh, really something you should use if you are bitten by a snake. There are snakes overseas that you do not want to use a bandage for, so just make sure you are um, familiar with your first aid uh, method for your local species. But in Australia, across the whole country, this is the method that you want to be using if you are uh, bitten by any of our venomous snake species. Before we wrap it up, pardon the pun, um, if it's too tight or too loose, your bandage, do you worry, what do you do in that circumstance? Because a lot of people think that they would take it off and reapply it if it's too tight or... Yeah you know an explanation would be great yeah absolutely so if you think your bandage is too tight um, you want to just ride it out and keep it on do not take the bandage off once you've applied it particularly if it's too tight because you may end up getting a, a rapid uh, movement of venom throughout your system which would be incredibly bad um, it's gonna happen eventually in hospital if you've bitten very badly they're gonna have to take the bandage off eventually but you may have had a couple of vials of antivenom by that point so you're going to be uh, seeing fewer effects hopefully um, but you do, do not want to do that on the way to hospital um, you know an hour after you've been bitten or anything like that you want to keep it on if it's too loose um, you do want to apply ideally another bandage over the top of that one because if it's loose and flying around in the wind like a flag I'm um, probably not going to be doing much to slow the movement of that venom it needs to be reasonably taut to compress the surface of the skin and basically slow the uh, movement or slow those lymphatic vessels um, slow them down from doing their job now I'm going to unwind this bandage now, um, but I did hope, uh, I do hope that you uh, enjoyed that. Um, we got to see the world's most venomous snake, which is always exciting. They are a beautiful snake, as I mentioned. You are never going to encounter one um, unless you actively go looking for them. Um, beautiful snake, very inoffensive, and all they want to do is be left alone like any snake. There's your first aid procedure, and uh, thank you very much, guys. I hope you enjoyed that, and we will see you next time. Thanks, guys. Bye.